Located in the Pacific Northwest, the infamous Cascadia Subduction Zone is a 600 mile long fault line off the coast that poses tremendous seismic risk to the communities of Oregon, Washington, Northern California, and Southern British Columbia, putting over 13 million people in danger. Here, the denser Juan de Fuca plate dives or subducts beneath a lighter North American plate. This geologic process is responsible for building the iconic landforms of the Pacific Northwest, including its beautiful volcanoes. Additionally, the Cascadia subduction zone has been the source of several catastrophic earthquakes in the past, including a magnitude 9.0 in 1700 that's effects were felt as far away as Japan. Geologists have worked around the clock to study Cascadia's many intricacies since its discovery in the 1970s. Due to the fact that Cascadia's hellish seismic potential wasn't ubiquitously accepted until the early 1990s, it's been a race against the clock to rebuild Seattle, Portland, and other areas of the PNW so that they don't get leveled during the next Cascadia megaquake. Seismic code was not enacted in the Pacific Northwest until 1994, and most of the area was built up prior to that, which presents quite the problem to us when the big one inevitably hits. By analyzing layers of soil in estuaries, beaches, and tidal flats around the Pacific Northwest, as well as utilizing radiocarbon dating of geologic material that was found in these areas, geologists have been able to build a timeline of past great earthquakes within the last 9,850 years. The number they came up with? 40. 40 great earthquakes within the last 9,850 years, averaging out to an earthquake every 246 years. The last big earthquake to hit Cascadia occurred 324 years ago, making the big one overdue by 78 years and counting. But it's not that simple. Averages are just averages, and geologists found earthquakes as close together as 27 years apart and as far away from each other as 577 years apart. So we can't in good faith say that Cascadia is overdue. Regardless, everyone wants answers. Everyone wants to know when the infamous big one is going to hit. Unfortunately though, we cannot accurately predict when the big one will hit Cascadia. Or can we? In this episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures, we're going to discuss the potential of predicting earthquakes by analyzing a phenomenon that was only discovered 20 years ago and that cyclically occurs in Cascadia and in other subduction zones all around the world. This phenomenon is known as slow slip, or episodic tremor and slip, abbreviated to ETS. Recent research in the field of seismology has suggested that it might be useful in predicting earthquakes. If we could accurately predict earthquakes, it would be an absolute game changer for society. Stick around to find out more about this revolutionary research and how it might be useful in not only predicting when the big one will hit Cascadia, but when big ones will hit fault lines all over the world. First of all, what is slow slip? Before we dive into that definition, let's first discuss some general physics of the Earth and of subduction zones. In subduction zones, one tectonic plate dives beneath another due to compressional forces being applied to the plates. The plates are not purely solid though. Deep within the subduction zone lies a ductile zone, where it's so hot that the plates behave like molten bodies rather than solid, brittle plates. These deeper sections of subduction zones are freely slipping, as opposed to the brittle zone above. Earthquakes only occur as a result of the crust being stuck when stress is applied, and an earthquake itself is the rapid release of this stuck crust. The shallowest part of a subduction zone is the locked zone, where the solid rock of the subducting plate is stuck on the plate it is subducting under. Immediately beneath this locked zone, the rock is still solid, but due to its depth and close proximity to the ductile zone, it can be more easily dragged by the ductile rock beneath. Slow slip occurs in this deep solid zone, between the shallowest locked zone and the ductile zone in the subducting slab. Slow slip is the gradual release of stress in a transitional layer beneath the locked zone but above the ductile zone, taking place over the course of weeks to months rather than in a few minutes. Slow slip often releases a comparable amount of energy as a normal earthquake, but again over the course of a few weeks rather than a few minutes. Thus, slow slip events are not felt by humans humans or animals, and they weren't even discovered until our highly sensitive instruments were first able to pick them up in 2001. 
Cascadia was actually the location where slow slip was first discovered, and since its discovery, it's been observed in virtually every subduction zone around the world. Depending on the subduction zone, slow slip can be a highly cyclical event that takes place in regular intervals. In Cascadia, it occurs about every 14 months or so on average, lasting a few weeks. In the Shikoku region of Japan, it occurs every six months. In Central America, it occurs every three months and lasts about seven to eight days. Due to its regularity, it has been dubbed episodic tremor and slip. It's episodic. The fact that it is episodic is great for us, because if it has regularity, changes in this regularity can signify a number of things and can be a red flag for us to observe more closely. This is where the prospect of predicting earthquakes from slow slip comes in. There's been some compelling research that suggests it could either be a sign of an impending earthquake or that it could cause earthquakes, and we'll discuss that in a minute. If you've gotten this far into the video and you enjoy geology and outdoor adventures, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. It would really help get more videos out to you guys. Alright, now to discuss slow slip possibly being a sign of an impending earthquake or the causation of an earthquake. Back in 2011, Japan suffered one of its largest earthquakes in the country's history, a terrifying magnitude 9.1 earthquake that violently shook the entire country for over 5 minutes and caused a tsunami that killed 20,000 people. An earthquake this size is what a full rupture on Cascadia would look like, though Japan's seismic engineering is leagues better than ours, so unfortunately, our cities would not fare as well as Tokyo. This earthquake occurred on March 11, 2011. Immediately prior to this, a slow slip event lasting over a month transpired on the Megathrust Fault, immediately beneath the segment of fault that ruptured during the 9.1 megaquake. And this isn't the only time in Japan that a slow slip event immediately preceded a large earthquake. According to the authors of this paper in the academic journal Tectonophysics, there is evidence that large aseismic slow slip events preceded a magnitude 6.1 earthquake in 2008, as well as the infamous 1944 Tonankai and 1946 Nankai earthquakes. Additionally, the 2004 Parkfield earthquake in California was preceded by three months of accelerated aseismic creep, suggesting that aseismic events can also precede earthquakes on strike-slip faults, not just in subduction zones. Though this phenomenon is observed in Japan, Japan isn't the only place where slow slip has preceded large earthquakes. Off the coast of Guerrero, Mexico, a magnitude 7.3 earthquake occurred in 2014 and was immediately preceded by a large episodic tremor and slip event, as outlined by Gabriel and Lee in AGU Advances. In 2012, a magnitude 7.6 earthquake occurred off the coast of Costa Rica, and it was preceded by numerous slow slip events leading up to the earthquake. These slow slip events were anomalous, occurring at much higher frequency than normal. Crazily, there is new evidence that suggests a 32 year long ETS event caused a magnitude 8.5 earthquake in Sumatra back in 1861. In 2018, a slow slip event was shown to have caused a magnitude 6.9 earthquake in Greece on the Hellenic subduction zone. I could go on and on, but basically we have examples of slow slip at least preceding, and in some cases causing, earthquakes from subduction zones all around the world. Due to several examples of slow slip preceding large earthquakes in subduction zones around the world, we may be able to utilize it to forecast large earthquakes, especially in Cascadia. Cascadia's regularity in ETS is a valuable phenomenon for these purposes, as ETS occurs roughly every 14 months here. Changes in frequency and or intensity of ETS could possibly signify an impending earthquake. So what does the ETS situation in Cascadia look like now? Thanks to the wonderful work of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, or PNSN, we can see a complete catalog of Cascadia's slow slip within the past 15 years. This graph represents the number of ETS epicenters recorded per day within the last 15 years, the y-axis representing counts of epicenters, and the x-axis representing time. The map represents ETS epicenters, or where geographically the ETS occurs. Significant ETS events occurred in September 2010, September 2012, September 2013, August 2014, December 2015, December 2017, July 2018, November 2019, and September 2020. The average frequency of significant ETS events for this period was 13.1 months. After September 2020, 
ETS events increased in frequency, occurring in October 2020, April 2021, October 2021, March 2022, October 2022, April 2023, and May 2023. Average frequency for significant ETS events during this period was only 4 months, as compared to the average frequency of 13.1 months from the previous period. Something worth noting is that since 2024, moderate ETS has been almost constant and increasing in Cascadia. So what does all of this data from Cascadia signify? Scientists can't yet definitively say. What we do know is that the Cascadia subduction zone is alive and well. Slow slip is evidence of this. The heightened ETS activity in Cascadia within the last few years could very well be a sign of things to come, or it could just be incidental. We'll have to wait to find out. There is evidence that suggests ETS has preceded large earthquakes, as seen in Japan, Mexico, Costa Rica, Indonesia, and Greece. With that being said, not every ETS episode causes earthquakes, and in fact, most don't. The reason for this is because each ETS episode adds stress to the locked portion of the subduction zone. Basically, as the stress in the subduction zone increases, a slow slip event may push the fault over the edge, providing the additional stress needed to overcome the friction in the locked zone of the fault, thus triggering a large earthquake. In summary, we can conclude that while not all ETS episodes trigger large earthquakes, they add stress to the subduction zone and may trigger earthquakes by pushing the system to a critical point of stress. This is not good news for Cascadia. Because it's been locked for 324 years, it has accumulated a tremendous amount of stress. Each ETS event adds even more stress to the system, and one of these days, there is a distinct possibility that a slow slip event will push Cascadia over the edge, causing a large and damaging earthquake. Frequency of ETS is highest in the southern section of the Cascadia subduction zone, beneath Northern California and Southern Oregon. The northern section of the Cascadia subduction zone, however, releases the most amount of energy during ETS episodes. The frequency and energy release of ETS in Cascadia lends further credence to what geologists expect, that the big one is most likely to either occur on the southern or northern end of the subduction zone. The whole thing could rupture in a magnitude 9 plus earthquake, but it's more likely that an 8 occurs on the southern or northern section. While it may not always be a signifier of earthquakes to come, slow slip can be a useful tool to perhaps issue earthquake advisories when the probability of a large earthquake is higher due to the ETS. Earlier this year, Japan issued its first ever megaquake warning, after a magnitude 7.1 earthquake hit off the coast of Kyushu. Basically, this megaquake warning instructed the public to stay alert as geologists determined that the probability of a megaquake was heightened, but not imminent. Perhaps we can utilize ETS and changes in regularity of ETS to issue advisories like Japan did in August 2024. One issue with that though is public mass hysteria, among other things. Ah, the many intricacies of geologic hazards and public safety. With regards to Cascadia, slow slip activity has increased since 2020, with significant events occurring at a much higher frequency than average since September 2020. Given everything we just learned, I wouldn't take this as a definitive sign of impending things to come, but I would definitely monitor this more closely and keep an eye out on the subduction zone, as we do have several examples from around the world of anomalous and heightened ETS activity preceding large earthquakes. If the big one happens within a few years, we may be able to correlate this heightened ETS activity to a large earthquake. If the big one does not occur within a few years, this period of slow slip may mean nothing more than a random period of heightened stress being added to the system. But what if the big one occurs in say, 15 years, and in the year prior to the earthquake, ETS absolutely goes haywire? These are all questions that we can ask in science, and luckily we now have the technology to observe these phenomena that were unknown to us in years prior. Regardless of the outcome, it is important to prepare for the big one. You can watch my video, The Cascadia Megaquake, exploring the earthquake that will destroy the Pacific Northwest, if you want a more in-depth analysis of what could happen in the event of the big one striking tomorrow. Thanks for watching this installment of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures, and I hope everyone out there stays safe and curious. Peace. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. If you enjoy content like this, please like the video and subscribe to the channel, and check out some of our other adventures right here. As always guys, thanks again and peace!